Hey, welcome back to uh, Unschooled Theology. Almost forgot the name of the show there for a second, so uh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> uh, be sure to like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. Comment below, and uh, let's let's get started today. Uh, we are going to talk about Genesis one two in a second, but uh, first, real quick, we'll pull back the curtain for a moment and let people know. We record uh, these shows in four episode chunks. And then after that, I have a chance to think about them. Sometimes if I'm on a decent pace, I edit them ahead of time. I'm a little behind right now. Got to get going on that. Uh, so <laughs> there are some things I think of afterwards where it's like, oh, I could have said that more clearly or I'll realize that in editing and whatnot. So I want to clarify a point. Uh, from a couple episodes ago here, where we talked about the idea of where it says God created the heavens, and the earth, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked about that as being, you know, God creating the spiritual realm and the, the sort of matter based earthly realm. Mm -hmm. And I, I could have clarified, I think, a little bit of what I meant by the spiritual realm and why, why there is that separation and why we're supposed to as man, I guess, bring those two ideas together. And that is uh, because, and this is sort of the way ancient cosmology worked, is the idea that the, the matter, and we'll see this actually as we get into to more of the uh, Genesis, more of the first day of creation here. Darkness is matter, and it's dark, and it's muddy, literally. And it, it has kind of a corrupting effect. And the spiritual is light and it's pure, right? And so um, I'm just getting as to, to why God would create like these two separate realms. And part of the reason for creating a spiritual realm, the heavens, uh, I think it relates a little bit or it could be understood well through um, kind of being related to Plato's idealism and his theory of forms. And so for those who aren't familiar, this is Plato's idea was that uh, take a tree, right? We have all these things that are trees and all these things that are trees, we call them a tree because they, um, they carry something of like this ideal perfect form of a tree that doesn't exist in the real world but it's, it's out there somewhere. Right. And, uh, mm. you know, you could argue about whether that thing actually exists or doesn't exist or whatever, but all these things that we call trees, they share these characteristics that remind us of this ideal form of a tree. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is sort of what I'm getting at with the spiritual realm is, is God created a realm where it wasn't these ideas, right? These spiritual things could be out there unmuddied, unsullied by what is earthly matter, right? And a place where they could stay pure. And so that as we try to apply these things, these ideals to the earthly form, as we'll see very quickly here with the fall of man, we'll see it before Noah's Ark, we'll see it in the Tower of Babel. There's this idea where, when the spiritual comes into contact with the earthly, it, it sullies the spiritual. So you need a being, humans, that as we'll see later on here, are part earth, part spiritual, right? We're dust and we're God breathed. And it's through this being that you can then take these perfectly pure ideas and apply them to the earth and make it work and make it orderly which is what we'll get into more here in genesis one uh let jesus me, obviously being the one who could do that best but let me let me just put in one small yeah interjection or at least the question that comes to mind as you're as you're outlining that is are you the, uh, is that suggesting then that 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 the earth is is fundamentally corrupted well that's is. that's what jumps into well, mind is well well, well, the, the earth well is it corrupted by sin or or is it from the initiation then corrupted? So that's, this, that's so, what it seems to imply. So I will say this. Or it's um, less than ideal. Let's use that right there to transition into this episode because we're going to okay. get into that right now. 
Um, okay, that's reason because we're going to talk here about Genesis one two, which is where we get the Earth without life. And one of these times, I'll remember to grab the good book here before we start the episode, uh, so that I can read the verse. Um, that's but, all right. You got you got seventeen on the shelf right yeah, there, so you're yes, good to go. Are you ready? That's true. I got quite a few. <laughs> uh, so so real quick here, we're going to get into Genesis one two in a second. So let's keep that idea in mind. I just want to hit. Um, I just want to say for people real quickly here, sort of an approach that we're going to take to Genesis 1. Uh, We're going to take a very, a a yes and approach is what I'm calling it. So uh, there are those who will say that the Bible, Genesis 1 specifically, uh, does describe the process of creation um, poetically, right? Dr. Hugh Ross, a matter of days here. And he would say this is a poetic description that could be understood across time of what is materially happening here. Meanwhile, there are other people like uh, John Walton. That, by the way, is known as the concordist view. Um, There are other people like this this character, John Walton, who uh, would say that if you read Genesis 1 and, and consider other ancient texts, this is very clearly a temple building narrative or a temple uh, establishment narrative Mm -hmm. and it follows those patterns now these two parties would argue against each other's interpretation uh my thought is why can't it be both uh Mm -hmm. i mean god is if god is who we say he is i think he could you know, put put in the hearts of men who's whoever is writing this, whoever was sharing this story, a, a way of saying those things that makes it both right, and yeah. even more things beyond that, right? Many different layers. So, to that end, the focus of the way we're going to think of Genesis one is uh, is the idea that God is describing conceptually how creation works and that's not to say that he's not also describing you know poetically practically how he did creation maybe even i don't know maybe even quite you know uh, literally literally, but i i personally am not persuaded of that but i it's possible i guess um as well as maybe it is some sort of temple setting um narrative you know uh but in addition to all that the perspective that we're going to take and focus on while we'll hit some other ones is this idea that God is in Genesis one describing how he conceptualized creation and what is the framework conceptually that creation is meant to work. How is it meant to work together? So each of these days will reveal something uh, about the fundamental concepts that underlie all of creation. Yeah. It would almost seem more shocking to me if that weren't the case, because I think that's that's the definition of depth within a within within anything spiritual. Yeah, and, and so it does seem it does seem like we should not be expecting so much. Yeah, yeah, and not yeah, fighting should... against each other's views and saying maybe it's both, maybe it's yeah, that beautiful. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's nothing there's there's you know there's no problem with critique, but um, but yeah, the, it would be it would be shocking if this would 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 be a text that would have survived this long without having depth right right you know yeah. The, yeah. it feels like it would have been eliminated very swiftly you know as per, per, perhaps some of some other more shallow spiritual myths are sure um, sure i mean no one's no one's at in a similar time period you have you know the enuma elish and the the babylonian myth myths the egyptian myths yeah all of these you have things. gilgamesh and things like that and yep. those are only you only read those if you take like a, a college mythology course or something right. like that right you know and it's not to that that's not to say that those didn't have significance to those cultures but it's also to say that they didn't win out in 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 having the most relevance to, to humanity, it, it which, is, which is another reason to respect the biblical stories. Yeah, it's like, I think of it like, um, like uh, classical composers, right? I mean, there was lots of other people doing work at the time, yeah. like Beethoven or Bach or that, but those things had a timeless quality to them, yeah. you know? Well, and um, even their own works survived right. very, very minimal, you know? So right. you don't, 
I am Bach created so many pieces mm -hmm. uh, yet we, we listened to a tiny fraction, you know, yes. one to 5% of what he yes. actually composed. And that's the same for most of the other composers as well. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, with that in mind, let's, let's take a look here now. Uh, I will, let's, I'll just read it real quick. Genesis one, yeah. two, uh, from the ESV, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we're going to break this down bit by bit, uh, not a whole episode to each phrase like we did with Genesis 1, but uh, we're going to... As tempting as that is. It is. It is. Uh, <laughs> the main key that I take away from this verse here is this is a perspective setting verse, right? We're about to have the action take place here in the next verse. Uh, that is the beginning of, of, you know, the story really starting here. But in this verse, it's setting, it's basically describing the setting before the action takes place. And so to that end, I want to look at each component of this, and this will get to uh, what we were talking about before, right? So what is the earth then? it being this you know corrupted thing it's not it's not that it's corrupted per se it's that the earth without the spiritual order is chaotic right uh so this is where, what we get to here with the beginning of this with the idea of formless and void mm -hmm. um how exactly to translate these words there's a lot of discussion in commentaries on this mm -hmm. and we don't have a great way to to really sum it up in one word, but uh, you might think of it as just being generally disordered. Mm -hmm. That's unfit for life. It's disordered. Chaotic is something you'll see here. Um, that's that's when I saw a lot of commentaries say that what's really trying to be summed up to this is that there is a chaotic mess, basically. Yeah. yeah. In yeah. absence of, in absence of what's about to come here in the coming verses, just the earth on its own, devoid of the spiritual. That's why we get to. Well, go ahead. I'm sorry. This is why this is important to 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 hack that out as to what the words actually mean, because you were even talking about Plato's theory of forms, and this mm -hmm. is where English could become confusing in the way we translate how Plato uses the concept of forms and then formless. So is right. he saying there was no idealized forms at this time? If you're if you're akinning that to if you're, you're so that, yeah. similar to, to that. Yeah. But it sounds like that's not what's going on here. It is, is what's being said is not that there's there's a di distinct spiritual and, and it's it's what is saying is that what has been created has a lack of order. Yes. Yes. The 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 spiritual ideals are not being enacted upon that matter, right? So oh, that's matter, interesting. Okay. The matter is existing separate from the spiritual ideals okay so That's this is this is describing those two as being apart right and mm -hmm. we'll see here that they're meant to work together but this is a description of the matter of the earth separate from the spiritual yeah and that is thus chaotic it is formless without void that, uh, that makes that makes sense with the formless. What about the empty? Because empty seems empty seems like a different concept than formless. Well, because empty means there's nothing there, kind of. Yes, yes. But, but the, you could you could let, let me just extend it out one please, second yeah. because like because if you take a if you take like a, a a mug or something like that and you say it's empty, well, there there actually is matter inside there at the moment but it's not mm -hmm. the matter that you expect. So it's empty from, from the perspective of what you would expect to mean being full. So, yes. so what is expected, I guess, maybe what is expected of the earth is that it's full of, to, from a human's perspective, that it's full of life and creation and, and, and all of the things that you go out normally and see. And so saying that it's empty would mean that it doesn't have those things at that time. Is that maybe what we're getting at? I, I think that's one of the ways I think to look at it. I also would say um, it's void of meaning, right? The spiritual is where we derive the meaning from. Oh, okay. So it's, it's the earth is sitting there void of the spiritual meaning. 
which is you know? something we would expect within it. Right. Well, it was created for that purpose, right? It yeah. It was created to, to enact the spiritual meaning. Well, yeah. And then that would also have to do with who the, who we talk about, who's the reader or who's, yes. who's the audience is this is, this is humanity who's reading this. And so right. humanity would expect there to be, I guess, unless you're a um, postmodernist, but most yeah. of humanity would expect there to be meaning within yes. the, within, within the world and would be surprised to find that there is no meaning, which is why that, that idea is so would be so jarring to people. Right. Okay, right. so it's empty right. both of the physical, but also empty of of the meaning. Significance, yeah. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. Significance is a good word. Um, okay, so we have formless and void. Then we get to this idea of darkness. Um, so this is this reemphasizes that element of chaos mm -hmm. uh, because light is order. Darkness represents chaos and disorder. This makes sense, of course. Anyone who's tried to walk around in the dark until they eventually get a light on knows that one is very chaotic the other is a, is a much more orderly process mm -hmm. um so mm -hmm. that's that is and at the same time light also represents the spiritual and darkness the the earthy matter of the world so you know putting these ideas together it's it's basically saying that the world is in a state of chaos it's lacking the spiritual light that is needed to bring order and that's coming soon for anyone who's you know read past Genesis one two, uh, so we'll we'll get yeah. to that light in a minute. Um, but that is setting the the state of the earth at that moment. Yeah, so that's significant. Um, yeah, and that's uh, uh, again maybe it does describe a moment in time as well, I guess. But to me, what is most important is it's something we can potentially call back on too and say when we move away from the light that's about to come when we move away from that spiritual light and focus on the earthly we push the world in the direction of being formless and void and dark and chaotic and not suitable for human life mm -hmm. right because that's the the natural state of the world if that makes sense it's, it's that's that's what's so that's i think the most interesting thing about this is the is the implication that the natural state of the world is natural only in, in so much as you say the first state of the world that that, well, the, that the creation is initiated and no and, no it's the reversion to the mean too it's not it's not that it's only the first it's the if it's like the earth takes proactive ordering right it takes that engaged proactive order we talked about um we talked about uh the bara creation right involving like this element of sustaining to it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that it like earth takes that in order for it to revert back to this formless chaotic state it must oh, be sustained okay. right so it's like this is if you allow the water to return to its level, the level is this formless, chaotic, and void, yeah, void, dark, all of that, unless you have the ordering work, element work being done. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, that's very interesting because that means that, and, and the, the one who initiates the actual ordering of, to begin with is God. Yes. And that and that activity is independent of the creation of just heavens and earth, right? Which is very interesting too. Yeah, it's yeah, it's describe. I, I think that's what this verse is trying to get get at for us is that there is the creation, and then there is this sustaining process, this ordering process. Yeah, um, yeah. To me, this really the first whole day here as we'll get to it, uh, wraps in the element of free will. I think what we see here with the idea of the earth being capable of being this formless, void, dark place is that, uh, and it needing to be ordered, ties to our ability to have free will. We can choose to participate in this ordering process, or we can choose to allow the earth to revert to its formless chaotic position yeah let me try to poke one hole sure 
I don't know if it pokes a hole, but it's the it's the objection that comes to my mind. So mm-hmm. I want to I want to like fortify this idea to try and make sure it's it's proper. Um, with this is one and two, so we're going to have to expand beyond what we're doing in this okay. episode just for doing okay. the back, I guess. It says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. Uh, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm-hmm. Is is that? Is that sentence acting the the possibility you could propose is that sentence is acting as a as a heading? In the beginning, God created the heavens, the earth, and now I'm going to tell you the story of how it happened. So there's not a separation between the creation of the heavens and the earth and the and the formless and void. Yeah, see, I that, look at it, but I think it is more. Uh, is it more chronological, or is it is that a chapter heading? Yeah, again, I see it. Uh, more conceptual, right? Um, I, I guess we could look at it as chronological. I think a lot of people would say it's, yeah, it is. It, if you're looking at it materialistically, you might describe it as a chapter heading. Right? Well, let me let me explain why it's important though, because what we're saying is is that that the initial state of the heavens and the earth is formless and without void, is separate. Exactly. So, so the creation of those things mm-hmm. occurs, and this is the state they're in, and then God orders it. Is what yeah. we're saying. The other option is if this is a chapter heading. I hope this makes sense. If this is a chapter heading. Then now the earth was formless and void. Is almost as though God stumbles upon this formless and void thing, and then begins to order it. And the right. ordering is actually the creative process. Does that distinction make sense? Yes, it does. And I, I personally see it more as, again, focusing conceptually or not thinking of like time or anything else. The, the first verse is saying both the heavens and the earth, both the spiritual and the earthly matter, God created them both. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and they both exist. And here then is what the, the earth looks like without the influence of immediately that after create yeah you I, well again you're adding a chronology to it a time which i don't think I, you can add that if you want to and say sure yeah maybe there was a point in time where god said i'm going to create the spiritual here the earth here and there's going to be a moment of time where i haven't brought the spiritual to act upon the earth well that's not even maybe the chronology so. is not even the the chronology is not as significant as it is of saying what what that verse means Right. Verse two means, does verse two mean that upon creation, the thing that's birthed out, I guess, for mm-hmm. lack of a better word, is, or maybe that's the right word, is, um, is earth formless and empty? Or is it that God comes upon earth as it is formless and empty, and then the creative process is the ordering of it? Yeah, That's no. why the chapter heading is so important, because right. if you're saying this is a heading, and then the start of the actual story begins that now the earth was formless and empty. Right. That, that means that, that the creative process to God and both could, I don't know, both have a lot of implications, but the creative process sure. to God then is ordering mm-hmm. is, is, is what the creative process is. The, the other option would be that the creative process is actually the, the, the man not manifestation birthing is really the best thing. The birthing of material the birthing of this reality so coming this, from God. So I that, that's about, the creative process. Well, I talked to you about the temple setting idea, right? Yeah. Yeah. And this is the, this is where people would look at it and say, well, it is about temple setting, right? So that the ancient person would have said, well, yeah, God is still like the actual source of all this matter and stuff. But what matters okay. about this chapter is that God took that matter and brought order to it. And that's Mm -hmm. the creation that we're talking about. Right. So he is still source, but the creation is the ordering process and something is not meaningfully created. It doesn't really exist until it has a, a functional component. Right. It's like, it's interesting. It's it's just out there. Right. So that is, yeah. That is a way of looking at it. For me, I look at it very much as verse one is just saying he created the earthly matter. He created the spiritual. These are two separate uh, concepts, if you will, the earthy matter and the the spiritual. 
And then verse two, by saying now the earth was without form, Boyd is just trying to give us a setting and say, before God enacts the spiritual upon the, the earthly matter, here is what the earthly matter at its essence is, at its root, this is what it is. Hmm. It's chaotic, hmm. form, formless, dark. It's those things. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. All right, we'll probably have more to talk about this as we get farther. There's more ideas and thinking yeah. of what of what the fall of man means then, but we'll we'll, we'll hold off oh, on yeah. those because we, those we are will, we will get because, to all that. Yes. Because that's a very interesting idea then. Yes. But big, but I but I do think the overall the overall concept that 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 the earth in its at its essence, that's a good word, at its mm-hmm. essence is formless and without void and is void and is empty of what we would expect it to be and requires um ordering in order to get to yes where it yes yes that's that's a good concept uh okay now uh so the next thing that's brought up um is the deep because the darkness is over the face of the deep this is an interesting line uh because the word here for deep is tehom mm-hmm. and it's been noted for its similarity to the babylonian god of chaos tiamat so oh. Tehom, Tiamat. Tiamat, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Marduk in the Babylonian myth kills Tiamat. And that's that process brings about, you know, uh, creation, the creation and order of and those kinds of things. So yeah. yes, you have to kill chaos in order. That's a very uh, chaos yeah. order type. So some, some people suggest that, well, that's just a coincidence, the relation of the words Tehom and Tiamat. And they say it's a coincidence because the word doesn't carry any mythological connotation to home, right? Uh, I, I would say maybe, though, that actually is the very reason that this is related to the Babylonian myth, right? We talked about in verse one the idea of, of it being antagonistic towards uh, other ancient myths and other ancient understandings of creation and and the divine and all of that so it it begs the question why include this word right because people say well it's referencing the water well you reference why not say water well and you reference the water in the next phrase and the spirit of of god was hovering over the face of the waters so why are you why are you specifically bringing up this word the deep here this tehom when you mention waters later it seems to me that the inclusion of this word must have some meaning. And I personally think that this is meant to be an overt rejection of the Babylonian myths. And it's, it is very specifically de-deifying the Babylonian gods, because we'll see this same process done with the sun and the moon. Uh, little preview of coming attractions, they are not given the name the sun and the moon, they're called the greater light and the lesser light light. And the reason it's that's being done is because the sun and the moon are gods in the surrounding mythologies. Yeah. Jeez, that makes and sense. so here, I think so this you're actually, deifies chaos as a God. I think, I think this is, yeah, this is de deifying. That's really the interesting. Idea of the, of the deep of yeah, yeah. Tiamat of this source, you know, Tiamat is like the source of creative material. Yeah, And here, this is going back again to Genesis 1, where God created the heavens and the earth and saying, yeah, that the deep that came, that's part of the earth that God created, right? That's why it's all in the same phrase as being formless and void and darkness being over the faces of the deep. That's all God created all that. So that Tiamat thing, that's not a thing. Well, the surface is the deep. I mean, it's very easy to, to, to to relate the, the concept of deep with the concept of chaos mm-hmm. because chaos is, is full of the idea of unknown and full of the idea of, of almost beyond, not beyond your capability of ordering, but, but unordered. And, and so the idea of deep being synonymous with, with, right. with chaos at some point and eventually transitioning meanings, that seems reasonable. That seems right. very, very reasonable. Um, interesting. So, uh, so we get, that's kind of the end of a phrase. And then we get another phrase here. And, and that first phrase leads us to the question of, well, God created the heavens and the earth. Why is earth in this state? 
Why is Earth chaotic? Why is Earth formless and void? Why is it this way? So it's from there we get to the idea of the spirit of God hovering over the water. Now this, I think very specifically, is describing a God not engaging with that creation. Mm -hmm. Right? He's just hovering over. He's observing. He's not directly engaged with creation yet, mm -hmm. which tells us that if we don't have God uh, involved in creation, this is the way it reverts, right? It becomes this formless, void, chaotic thing. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what this, again, uh, uh, sort of perspective setting of this verse does is puts a perspective of here's a God not engaged. Here's God hovering over it. Here's what it's like when he's not directly involved in sustaining his creation. Yeah. It's full of, um, this is just more poetic than anything, but it's, it's full of anticipation. I think of this in, yep. in the, it, I think of this in the way you see, uh, well, I mean, the silence before the storm is a cliched phrase, mm -hmm. but music, um, especially can be this way too, of, of the, of the moment where you're going along in something and then complete silence happens within a, a piece of music. Mm -hmm. And, and there is immense anticipation in that silence of what will happen, yeah, what's which is next. the idea of potential yes, and the idea of what, what can be created out of nothingness. So, I mean, silence in the, in the auditory sense is nothingness. So what yep. could, what could come out of this? And that's, I mean, poetically, what's very, very well being created, carved out here, mm -hmm. which it has to be purposeful then. Because, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, as we, it, it, they could easily say in the beginning, God created the heavens, the earth, and he said, let there be light. And there was light. You could easily skip over this and right. go straight into the, the earth, you know, gets filled with all of the things that you expect to be in it. But you're first creating this, this, this absence of everything. You yes. know? And so it makes you, yes. I don't know, as a, as a human who has the opportunity to partake in the something that comes after these right. words and phrases that's um, gratitude, I guess would be the best way to encapsulate mm -hmm. it. Oh yeah. It, yeah. There has to be an immense amount of gratitude for that. Yeah. That you're able to participate in, in what's about to come. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, gratitude and, and responsibility, I think is, is what, I come to eventually when we get to the end of Genesis. Well, that, here. and that's probably the, that's probably the end of, of gratitude. Yes. Oh, for if sure. you're, if you're mm -hmm. grateful for mm -hmm. something, but you're not seeking to, to respond to that, then, then, then your gratitude may be in, insincere. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, as properly as you can. Yeah, it's a different sentiment. I don't know what that word would be, but it's a, we need a word for that, I suppose. Um, yeah. I don't even know if it's gratitude then. I think it's fronting, but yeah. 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 And just uh, to, again, hit on the, the language differences, the, the word for spirit here is Roush. And uh, you can look and see the other places this word is translated. It, it, it is spirit. It is used that regularly. It's also used as breath. It's also used as wind. And so these are things you... Uh, there's no tactile connection to it, right? And so that's what God is at this moment, is passing over like a breath, like a wind, right? Uh, these mm -hmm. things that don't, you, they may have an effect, but there's not a connection to them yet, uh, which is coming. And then lastly- uh, Which also only, I'm sorry, really quick, which also ahead, yeah. only adds to the poetry of that mm -hmm. Oh, for sure, for sure. Of, of, of their truly, not only God being- immensely powerful but in this moment seeming to not be the, the same way that 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 breath is is, right. is it's soft it's it's not, hardly even noticed that's right. that's shocking right yes um yeah even wind too right something that that has tremendous potential wrapped into it too we you can see wind you can see it knock over uh, uh buildings you can see it erode cliffs over time it's something that packs mm -hmm tremendous potential but it, it has to act upon something you know yeah uh and then okay and lastly uh the water um this i think so again we could look at this as being um another response to the babylonian myth 
um, because it's actually there's three gods of water and uh, it's sort of through them that they they bring forth creation these three gods of water uh, Tiamat being one of them but that is the source of creation and here it's just no it's it's just water <laughs> you know mm -hmm. it's not it's not acting as a source of creation mm -hmm. um, at all and so we're, we see things that don't have the power of gods as they do in the in the babylonian myths instead mm -hmm. we see th the waters as part of this chaotic uninhabitable uh uninhabitable mess mm -hmm. uh without the god of israel so it's it's a further i think rejection of those things as well as we'll get to uh in a little bit uh, the symbolism of water we'll get to that once we look at the at the formation of land a little bit closer um, but there is something to the idea of water being this constantly changing thing and not something that is you know rooted uh, that has any sort of consistency to it um, yeah. so and as well as being uh, uh, something a little bit a little bit between the spiritual air and the uh, the hardy, you know, solid earth, water is kind of a, a place in between those two. But that that we'll get to, like I said, in, in later stuff. So, a so going, go ahead. A small point that might further your you, the the point you're trying to make about gods, this being rejection of gods being inherent in these things, like the deep and the waters, is to say that the it, it prefaces that with now the earth was formless and empty. Mm -hmm. And to suggest that there is waters there and potentially the deep, which might be a reference to, to another particular God, you, you are saying they're empty though. And if there were a God there, you wouldn't be recommending that they were, right. you wouldn't be saying right. that they're empty. And mm -hmm. so that, it, that made me even further the idea that there's, that they're rejecting the idea yes. that those, that there are gods inherent in those physical things. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think for sure. That's so. interesting. Uh, okay, so if you look at the, the verse as a whole, um, with verse 1, 2, that we see now that this is really setting the table. It's describing the earthly world, how it looks without God's direct involvement. It certainly can't sustain life without mm -hmm. the, the order that God's going to bring to it. Um, and so I, I look at these these verses together. We talked a little bit about verse 1 as describing the, the human condition in a way right um i think i think that's what what we see here is that we see the human condition described we see the explanation that reality is a mix of both a spiritual and matter-based component right and we see that it has to be if it's going to sustain otherwise it's just chaotic mm -hmm. and empty um and so we see those two ideas uh, brought together here right? The, mm -hmm. the human condition is we're not God. Mm -hmm. And so that means we can't be the ones to, on our own, uh, fix this chaotic, disorderly mess. Yeah. Uh, we need the God who created the spiritual in the heavens to do that, the God yeah. outside of time, yeah. uh, as we we're told about in the first verse. And so that's, this leaves the obvious qu uh, question here. Okay, well, then how should, if we're looking at earth uh, separate from that that spiritual connection how should that connection go together then right because they obviously need to go together yeah how should that look and yeah. that is that is the rest of genesis one i think yeah yeah so all right join us next time as we'll look at uh at verse three and uh be sure to subscribe and all that so you can make sure you get uh get notified of when this comes out, like it, comment. If you're on the podcast, leave a review, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. And uh, we'll see you then.